So I'm, uh, I'm here with Nader Naderi. He is an Afghan, uh, and his last position uh, before the uh, collapse of the Ghani regime in Afghanistan uh, a couple of years ago was as the director of Afga Afghanistan Civil Service. Uh, this is a topic that I've been extremely interested in myself because I think that all states need strong bureaucracies and uh, the challenge of building uh, a bureaucracy in conditions uh, of state collapse like the one that Afghanistan faced was, was one of the most difficult uh, in, um, you know, of all the state building problems that, that you can face. Uh, so Nader, um, let's just begin by setting the scene. Uh, uh, you were working for Ashraf Ghani, who was president at the time. There was a negotiation with the Taliban, uh, and, you know, the situation came apart very rapidly once the Biden administration decided that uh, it was going to uh, pull out. Uh, maybe you could just tell me your view, you know, could uh, a, a Western-backed regime have uh, survived in Afghanistan had the Biden administration not made that decision. Well, thank you very much, uh, Francis, for having me. Uh, it's it's always fascinating to to look back into uh, the process of state building mm -hmm. and, and building uh, institutions and making them to hoard and back. And a key element to that experience that I have seen was this political stability that would enable societies uh, to harden institutions through a period of time which unfortunately we have we we didn't have some people say 20 year is a lot of time but building back state institutions as mm -hmm. you very well trace them uh, in, in your different work uh, it, it takes a it's long longer. period of time and one part of that uh, uh, that the question of stability and peace building, uh, one of the, the key uh, ingredients of, of making a state function and prolong and harden that. Uh, in my view, uh, Afghanistan could survive uh, had it not been by some missteps and mm -hmm. wrong policy choices that both we as Afghans have made but mm -hmm. also our international partners made and, mm -hmm. and on top of that the United States and what are those uh, what were those missteps and, and wrong choices the first one was Afghanistan could live and continue be a, a, an open country a, yes a f very fragile uh, uh, democracy but could strengthen into that in a long period of time with all the freedoms and rights that were there if it was not a premature decision to pull the plug abruptly mm -hmm. and why I say abruptly because it, the peace process was just at the, at the beginning stage of mm -hmm. it and the only leverage uh, we as the Afghan Islamic Republic had against the Taliban at that position was to negotiate while the international forces are on ground mm -hmm. as guarantors mm -hmm. of the elements of the, uh, uh, the political process. And then when the announcement came that the forces would leave on certain date, mm -hmm. then the incentive for the Taliban diminished entirely sure. to engage on political. The second a key uh, uh, factor uh, into this rapid collapse uh, was uh, a decision to negotiate withdrawal of forces with a terrorist group that was known mm -hmm. and named in many documents uh, by the national security apparatuses in the United States as the terrorist and then evolved to insurgency and then mm -hmm. to a negotiating partner that negotiating with them to withdraw forces instead of negotiating with the Afghan state, uh, uh, not negotiating, but arranging it, what to, mm -hmm. how to withdraw. Mm -hmm. So, intendedly or unintended consequence of that process was that uh, it gave legitimacy to the Taliban's mm -hmm. claim that they defeated the United States uh, and the NATO allies. And therefore, the government in Kabul have lost the ground and was considered as okay it doesn't have the legitimacy because the Doha deal even 
does not mention a single time mm -hmm. the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan and the United States shy away from its key partner that have had a strategic partnership agreement, its president mm -hmm. flew to Kabul to sign that uh, strategic partnership and had a bilateral security agreement, dumped it and threw it under the bus and even did not mention a single time. That created a psychology of mm -hmm. itself mm -hmm. where the security sector uh, found itself lacking the right and institutional arrangement already that needed to facilitate that transition as an mm -hmm. example for logistics, for procurement, uh, for uh, maintenance of the equipments and mm -hmm. the planes, all of that suddenly gone mm -hmm. and therefore uh, it began to crumble down. But we made as Afghans very wrong choices, as an example. My boss, the president, have made wrong choices in terms of when to start, what kind of leverage it, it had in the peace process, what kind of negotiation with its partner need to, to happen, the United States, and he lost the sympathies of, interna uh, of its international partners, but also could not communicate with the public. Also, mm -hmm. our institutions, including me being part of the government and others are responsible also, but we could not communicate to our public rightly to distinguish between the risks that were coming through this process mm -hmm. and then the need for making peace and what are those two mm -hmm. uh, uh, the need for peace was there but the risks needed to be identified so that we could buy in the public mm -hmm. uh, uh, on our side uh, so basically it was not a mutually hurting stalemate uh, uh, it was not stalemate for Taliban because they didn't care about the lose of life mm -hmm. Uh, and it was a statement on our side because we didn't have the time and the resources. Uh, right. So th those were a combination of uh, key factors, I would say. So one of the things that obviously surprised the Biden administration was the speed of the collapse. Uh, they were evidently expecting that the government could hold on. You know, Henry Kissinger had this idea of a decent interval uh, because you know there was a fear that there would be an ultimate collapse, but. Uh, they believe that you know the Afghan state could hold on for at least a few months uh, before it reached a sudden crisis, and yet it happened almost overnight. Were you surprised by that outcome also? Uh, partially, yes, uh, because in my discussion with security ministers, uh, uh, I was in Doha most of the time negotiating with Taliban, but those weeks and uh, I was in Kabul, uh, including a day before uh, the collapse. Uh, and in my discussion with the, uh, uh, with the security ministers, yes, they were unhappy with the, the way the chain of command was structured uh, uh, by, by the government and the way the interferences by a specific office of national security was happening in terms of decision making mm -hmm. in the chain of command. The hierarchy was not there and chain of command was collapsed already. But then they were, uh, uh, they, they were talking about the amount of logistical support they have had mm -hmm. in terms of uh, uh, procurement, especially the ammunition and the fuel mm -hmm. and the uh, 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 medics and all of those that mm -hmm. existed, those suddenly were cut off. So mm -hmm. a lot of security officials were saying this is not going to survive for long if we are not replacing, we are not uh, uh, in a speed bringing alternative to maintenance that were contractors and with the mm -hmm. U.S. withdrawal, all of them ahead of time, months before, received notification that they should leave. And then the ammunition, they were lacking ammunition and the stockpile was going significantly down because the military operation of Taliban was all over the country and, and they were running, the Afghan forces were running uh, of ammunition. That was not in place. So the mm -hmm. assessment was three months probably. Mm -hmm. uh, if alternatives are not provided and new methods of uh, pr uh, procurement and provision of the ammunition and uh, maintenance is not, are not provided. But then because on the, on the 15th of August, information that received by President Ghani through his key aides, unfortunately were not based on much of those realities mm -hmm. and therefore he left the country and because our constitution you talk about mm -hmm. uh, in, in different uh, uh, writings about how centralized a strong state and institution mm -hmm. a, a strong presidency could uh, uh, create ineffectiveness mm -hmm. uh, and that's an example in Afghanistan because presidency and chief and commander-in-chief have 
all the authorities mm -hmm. and the presidency have accumulated so much power and then decision making within right. the palace and that was uh, uh, unfortunately a wrong policy choice too when he left the institution crumbled down and that uh, was really a morale a collapse. morale collapse and and there was no place to make decision anymore mm -hmm. to to keep the surrounding of Kabul and the military forces you would uh, all of them gathered in Kabul and its surrounding. Mm -hmm. But of course we lost a lot of territory mm -hmm. and the morale was gone because the wrong U.S. Uh, PR, the U.S. Uh, Special Envoy, Ambassador Khalilzad, was promoting Taliban mm -hmm. and promoting the day of change and then because of his way of campaigning uh, and because the way that the decision about the withdrawal was uh, uh, was made and the time was not provided for a political process to go on mm -hmm. and because of the public's frustration of a large number of bodies coming every day and because they were seeing the government is not making progress and we failed to communicate properly to, mm -hmm. to public too that what are at, uh, 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 here at stake uh, and all of them of them combined made the forces to feel that they are abandoned. Mm -hmm. uh, they're not receiving ammunition, they're not receiving air support, they're not receiving intelligence information that they, they were supposed to receive before or were receiving through the, the partnership with the NATO allies. So all of that gone. Mm -hmm. uh, combination of all of this created the psychology that the forces were feeling that probably the U.S. have made an agreement to give the power to the Taliban mm -hmm. and therefore why we should kill ourselves. However, they bravely fought, as an example, Hellman fought to the last days. There were many other locations, uh, Logar fought, other provinces around Kabul, a number mm -hmm. of places they fought to, to the last of days and a lot of sacrifices were made by mm -hmm. those young soldiers and officers. Uh, but then at the end it was a political collapse. Yeah. Yeah, I find the role of Zalmay Khalilzad very puzzling. You know, uh, he was a friend of mine, still is. Uh, I've known him since graduate school, but uh, it seems to me that um, uh, he was not negotiating a good uh, agreement, and I suspect there's a lot of Afghans that you know feel that way. Just as a matter of curiosity, you were close to President Ghani. Have you had any contact with him since uh, the fall of the regime? No, no. Uh, when when he left, uh, mm -hmm. the last time I saw him was when um, the first province mm -hmm. uh, uh, where I come from a uh, fall, and there were people close my relatives who lost their life in fighting for uh, mm -hmm. the republic, and then we met in in that conversation, which puzzles me today. Uh, to date, uh, he told me that yes, things are difficult, but it will take six months to turn everything around. Mm -hmm. And I knew we didn't have six months, mm -hmm. uh, so that was the last time. And uh, since she, since he left the country, mm -hmm. uh, he hasn't been in touch. No. Well, yeah, I'm afraid there are a lot of people that didn't cover themselves in glory uh, in this whole period. Well, let's go back to the um, broader question of state building. Uh, tell me the condition of the Afghan civil service. I mean, this is a country that after the Soviet invasion in December 1979 was almost continuously in a state of civil war uh, uh, really without a government or, with a, or a despotic Taliban government uh, and then the Americans come in uh, when you took over uh, directorship of the civil service what did you have to work with? Well, uh, in 2001 when uh, uh, the US intervention in Afghanistan, a new government was formed. I was part of the, we were known later on at Bonn process, the Bonn conference mm -hmm. where the UN facilitated a new government. I was very young and I was an activist mm -hmm. uh, invited there to be part of the observe, uh, observation of the process and participate in the, in the talks. And when we went back, uh, it was a collapsed state. So we needed to build back everything from scratch. Uh, while the state was collapsed, surprisingly, some elements and institutional culture of civil, sec civil service sector remain from previous decades. Mm -hmm. So we had a functioning civil service sector uh, uh, under the king. Uh, this is Zahir Shah. This is Zahir Shah, and up until 1973, and then all the way to 1978, uh, when uh, uh, President Dawood 
had a coup and then uh, took took the power. Still, the state institutions and civil service sector existed, but on a very small uh, uh, scale. Uh, its reach was not all over the country. It was not providing every services to everybody. But then, with its size comparatively and comparing to the later stages, it was. When I look deeper, I see that it was a functioning civil service and it had its own institutional culture also. The Soviet came in, so a socialist uh, organizational culture that everything in the state must defend the, the government and the pol Politburo. Mm -hmm. And then the Taliban, the Mujahideen came, it was into fighting, they took every portion of civil service sector as part of reward for themselves. Mm -hmm. And then the Maybe Taliban. They put their own people in. Not only they put their own people in, but it was known their own territory, mm -hmm. and they know uh, whatever resources that were coming there were not used much for public services, but rather for the for the group uh, distribution itself. Mm -hmm. But then the Taliban uh, put a, a final nail into the operational aspect of the of the civil ser uh, service sector in post two thousand one. Uh, some remnant of that civil service sector that remain all the way throughout all of these years remain existed still and they they, they had that resilience mm -hmm. and the reason they still were there was because economy was dysfunctional and collapsed economy the only place that they could get salary was the public sector mm -hmm. so, so people and individual continued to be attached to the organizations mm -hmm. while the organization didn't exist anymore they had to sign this attendance sheet, mm -hmm. sheet still afterwards but, by the way under president Karzai at that time was was he using the civil service as a kind of patronage machine to it build begin, support for himself? It began first uh, 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 under the Bonn Agreement there was a commission, a civil service reform commission mm -hmm. uh, was mandated and it was created and the purpose was to build this new bureaucracy. The World Bank was involved and all the donors were involved to reform the, the civil service sector. So the outcome and the consequences of the patronage and the same culture that existed from the 1990s throughout 1990s uh, were further enlarged and different political groups through the Bonn Agreement took authority of different government institutions, they became ministers and therefore they expanded their institutions. There was donor willingness to fund and write the, the wages bill. Uh, what it brought about was uh, when in 2017 I took charge of the uh, as the chairman of the Civil Service Commission I realized that just over 15 years the size of civil service sector have grown four times bigger wow. and it was when I was comparing it to our physical capability uh, uh, the, 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 the state's physical space mm -hmm. it was not possible and it was very obvious to me that in the long term we cannot sustain this large uh, number of public uh, officials and civil mm -hmm. servants and we have to shift all the resources from program and delivery of services to the payment and the operational to the payment of salaries because we, we didn't yeah. have and we cannot sustain it for longer term. So the first thing I did was to put a cup on the uh, size of the civil service. So I, I begin to say we're not increasing the size of the civil service sector anymore. Every year there was during the budget there was this negotiation of each minister would come with proposal for the size of the ministry as much as your ministry is bigger you're more important and therefore there were different departments created overlapped in different uh, ministerial level and the approval of the size of the personnel was uh, uh, the job and the mandate of the civil service commission and that's why I, I said no more increase. So we put the cap mm -hmm. and prevented further increase. But then we started looking into the overlap of the mandate. And then there was at least 23 overlap of mandates between the different departments of the government. Cleaning that was another uphill battle because if you cut a part of a, a ministry that is not even relevant to it, but expanded because of the power the minister had to expand it, it was a political battle mm -hmm. that a lot of people would have been unhappy and we, we needed to slowly, carefully push through a, a, a 
surgically removing mm -hmm. those uh, uh, unnecessary parallel structures mm -hmm. that were repetitive uh, uh, of the mandate and, and were wasting resources. Mm -hmm. So that was one part of it. The second part of it was that the entire public sector was captured. A bigger portion of it was captured by influential individuals at the provincial level, former warlords, uh, uh, other strong political leaders, either at the provincial level or at the, um, at the national level. And they were putting their own people as directors, as, as deputy directors, while there was a process as part of the civil service uh, law that they needed to be merit-based, competitive. However, parliamentarians were heavily involved, and those competition meant nothing because mm -hmm. the announcement was made to a very limited pool of people that they already chosen to not the general public were aware of that uh, and and the institutions were just uh, rotating with these power-based yeah. politically connected powerful individuals mm -hmm. uh, uh, that were receiving support and was facilitated through the commission unfortunately to go there when I was asked to go there, I was reluctant because the commission was known as the Civil Service Corruption Commission. Mm -hmm. and, and I was like, oh my God. And it was a big mess. So I had to first reform the commission itself mm -hmm. <laughs> to, mm -hmm. to build public confidence, then right. to move there. Right. And then, then the step that we took was to the public's perception of the commission was that it's a place where you re it recruits for public sector, mm -hmm. the only provider of job in the country. Because again, public sec the the economy, the private sector was so weak, was not attracting much or mm -hmm. uh, uh, hiring much of people, and still graduated young, new capacities were seeking to come to the government because mm -hmm. that was a sustainable uh, job opportunity. So we needed to reform the entire recruitment process, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which we did. And something that uh, 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 influenced by your great book, The Political Decay and Political uh, 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 Order, uh, and I begin to looking into this, uh, the entire process or project of state building in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. We built a state and then we didn't do right things on the rule of law. Mm -hmm. So there was an absence of rule of law. Yes, we did uh, uh, build a new, con develop a new constitution, adopted it, and there was, of course, certain control or, s or certain things. But democratic accountability came way ahead of the rule yeah. of law finding yeah. roots. Mm -hmm. And that made us like the politicians, the parliamentarians, were not really holding the government accountable, but mm -hmm. using its power to bring their people to the government that, office. That's fascinating. Uh, the sequence in which you put these institutions in place is so important. In the West, the legal institutions came before democracy, mm -hmm. and so there are constraints on the way that powerful political figures could use the government. Uh, but in many cases, when democracy comes before those rules are in place, then the government simply becomes a patronage machine meant to serve the interests of the different political actors out there that want to capture the state. So you seem to be saying that that's what happened in Afghanistan. That exactly. That was somebody took uh, uh, taken that blueprint of doing it wrongly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and how to do it wrongly, mm -hmm. they did it that way. Uh, when after the Bonn uh, uh, agreement in 2000, in December 2000, uh, 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 2001, uh, 20 uh, plus years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was two years to build uh, all the state institutions mm -hmm. rapidly. Mm -hmm. The timeline, the roadmap was, was uh, uh, suggesting that. Nobody thought of a long-term perspective of how to make a functioning state and a functioning democracy to become a role model in a very troubled region. Everybody was through short uh, uh, time frame and short time gains. Uh, so the short sightedness was so obvious mm -hmm. when, when I was looking back. So the colossal task of building all of these three elements, the state rule of law and democratic accountability, was first squeezed into two years and then handed over to a group of leaders who have had no experience of statesmanship, politics, or uh, institution building. Mm -hmm. And then what happened, every donor came in 
and then they had their own agenda, uh, agenda and their own blueprint mm -hmm. what could work better in their way. Mm -hmm. And then in two years, we adopted the new constitution, which was good, a consultative process, and there was, uh, uh, of course, a buy-in, and the public were so enthusiastic because of the experience of the history that they have had. They wanted to see uh, uh, everything is uh, uh, codified, and, and this constitution was, was endorsed. There were, of course, opposition to it, but also collectively uh, endorsed it. But then we immediately went to elections. And that began one of the key sources of the collapse. Also, the foundation of it was built there. Uh, we built election commission, first run by internationals and then hybrid. And again, uh, 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 for uh, there were five elections throughout all of this. So the first one was presidential. Euphoria was a lot. People were so excited. Nobody looked much into their irregularities. Mm -hmm. While President Karzai was so much... Uh, f uh, uh, famous and popular and, and liked by a lot of people. We, at that time, very young, we were thinking, okay, now President Karzai gets a popular mandate, and then he would then use that popular mandate to start bringing reform, cutting the warlords, limiting the power of the influential power holders, and bringing rule of law. That didn't happen. Mm -hmm. So his way of uh, governing was a big tent giving handouts of power in the government positions to different power bases in, in a state of marginalizing them. Mm -hmm. And then the election commission was never reformed. Over $500 million was spent in different elections in a poor country like Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. And UN never learned how to do it better next time. Mm -hmm. So we didn't have a voter registry. Mm -hmm. We didn't have proper data about who is the voter and where. Uh, and the entire commission was to the end because it was serving the interest of the politicians and the UN was taking it easy. The donors were not putting enough emphasis between the elections. And nobody was uh, uh, like even talking between the elections about the election commission and the reform of it. Mm -hmm. And then we lost legitimacy uh, of the outcome of the political process. Right. An institution emerged out of these elections did not have the legitimacy yeah. while they were handing... Uh, uh, they, they were they were having hands in practices that were undermining rule of law, like the parliament and the provincial councils. Uh, so that uh, in itself have created a situation where democratic accountability, apart from the media and the freedom of press, did not function well and did not bring public closer to the state mm -hmm. uh, so that they could trust it more. Mm -hmm. So, Nader, that's, uh, that's really fascinating. I think that uh, the Americans in particular put so much focus on elections as the core of a democracy without even thinking that if you don't have a competent state to administer the elections, you're not going to get to ones that are uh, really regarded as legitimate. And the last uh, uh, presidential election that was held, you know, it seems to me wasn't really the voters' choice. It was a negotiation between various power holders that uh, someone once described it as an election-like event rather than <laughs> an actual election. But would you say that that's accurate? Yeah, but unfortunately, yes, uh, not only the last election, number of elections mm -hmm. have gone through uh, uh, that way. Uh, both the politicians, those involved in the election, like the candidates have started undermining the elect electoral processes by organizing their own supporters in a way that if I don't win, then everything is illegitimate and therefore therefore but then also those in power as an example president karzai was in power he had every single opportunity to reform the election commissions in a way that could be uh, 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 to to uh, to come out of the tests of those difficult times of elections mm -hmm. in a better way mm -hmm. uh, so that his legacy would be uh, a much more stronger democratic institution. And then President Ghani and Dr. Abdullah, both of, of them partners mm -hmm. into the, into the uh, uh, national unity government, they had an opportunity also to strengthen. There was some attempts, as an example, we tried to bring in uh, electronic voting and there was things that were uh, practiced in 
uh, uh, in, in Nepal and in Philippines and in Indonesia and it was and in India and many other places uh, and we did some work on that but unfortunately the donors were not supportive of uh, uh, of it to pay for it and because we could not uh, afford financially to pay for that for that expensive operation either uh, but then they had an opportunity to have a better election commission much more tested uh, against the fraud and corruption, and, mm -hmm. uh, but that they failed also. The last election uh, happened in a time where there was a number of other contradictory issues that were and developments were happening. On top of what uh, was happening was the U.S. Taliban negotiation, and the U.S. negotiator uh, uh, basically had an interest for election not to happen. Mm -hmm. So they were saying delay the election. However, instead of building a political consensus, working with the sitting president and sitting uh, 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 chief executive officer, that they could see the longer term benefit of if there was a need for the peace process to come together mm -hmm. and then have an opportunity for the Talib to be part of an uh, uh, electoral process. They did not work with their key partners, mm -hmm. and they went around, talked to every other politician, and created an environment of divide and rule, mm -hmm. uh, because they wanted to see the presidency weaker, so the president could not resist. Mm -hmm. And they, uh, uh, the, the U.S. negotiator could not, or the, the special envoy could not, work closer with the president and with the CEO in convincing them. On, the, on their side also, the president and the CEO could not actually find a common ground to find a, a, a solution for the future and a better, if they go to election, they could do it in a better way. And the president could not also work with, because there was a high degree of distrust between him and between uh, uh, US Special Envoy for Peace, Ambassador Zal. So all of these individuals have failed to bring about a, a kind of a process that mm -hmm. politically it could have been legitimate or to delay the election if it was needed but then also there was this question that if we go to to make political discussion and negotiate with Taliban for a political settlement a government need to have a stronger mandate and our mandate comes to an end the president was arguing and therefore we need to have an election in order to have uh, 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 a stronger mandate for peace talk and both of the candidates run on the uh, mm -hmm. peace platform however the election came uh, at the time when the violence were so high when the public was much more disillusioned with the government and with the Taliban where the US was every day was saying we're pulling out we're pulling out uh, morale in general was so low. Civil society came under enormous attack by the Taliban. There were assassination of the key uh, civil society leaders. An organization that I created, Free and Fair Elections Foundation, that was monitoring elections throughout the country and was promoting democracy, uh, became one of the very successful institutions led later on when I joined the government by a very strong pro-democracy uh, young leader. Uh, he was assassinated in Kabul and civil society was discouraged also mm -hmm. uh, and media was focused much more on, on the need for ending the war uh, and that resulted in a very low turnout. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. so the turnout was all, all in all was two, mm -hmm. at, uh, uh, close to two million or mm -hmm. below and that gave a very bad mandate mm -hmm. uh, and then there was dispute over the electoral process and the fraud and the two candidates didn't agree to it, and there was two inauguration uh, and uh, sworn in of two presidents. And that was a very bad day for the country mm -hmm. uh, uh, in that sense. Yeah. Now, looking more narrowly at the civil service itself, you're holding the line against these efforts by political actors to basically grab parts of the state and use it for their own purposes. Were you actually able to build any real capacity in terms of training, you know, younger civil servants that were dedicated to serving the country as a whole as opposed to serving a particular warlord or mm -hmm. factional interest? Yeah, the, 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 the good uh, uh, news at that time was that, that we have had a larger number of 
highly educated, newly graduate young Afghans, both from Afghan universities, Afghanistan universities, and those who educated abroad. Yeah, one of them being my students. So Absolutely. I, yeah. And I put him as the, uh, uh, to, to lead, uh, uh, for a period of time, our Civil Service Institute. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and the Civil Service Institute was mandated to train and build new capacities. Uh, of course, throughout the years, the hundreds of millions of dollars were spent, but they were very wrongly uh, mm -hmm. directed. So we had to reform it change the mandate uh, uh, entirely to, to, to some extent and, and then uh, also narrow the focus to only build mid-level and senior level uh, 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 civil servant leaders uh, where they could have uh, uh, developed some sort of uh, uh, rapport with each other, they, they could feel that they are one class, uh, that working toward one national objective, that they are not serving special mm -hmm. interest groups' interest. But this was the beginning of process. So what we start doing, while the public's expectation was that you reform everything overnight, yeah. politically it was not possible. But we started first targeting, cutting the, the nepotism and the corruption into the recruitment processes and that by putting in new rules and procedures by reforming the law by putting a computer-based uh, 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 civil service exam center both in Kabul but across the country also mm -hmm. one of the disadvantages of the past system was that for women that they were not able to apply for grade 2 the senior the director level civil servants and mostly because they required to come to Kabul several times to get a form and to then do the uh, written exam and to do the interview and several times and that was preventing them to uh, to come so we made online a big part of this so mm -hmm. it become accessible to a lot of women and then we invited a lot of civil society and gave them access throughout the entire process mm -hmm. the media uh, uh, we, we uh, gave unquestioned uh, unlimited access that they should come and, and look into the processes and we established the exam centers across the country all computer-based uh, through a, a, a cloud Mm -hmm. uh, a, a national cloud system where they would the questions and mm -hmm. then we separated the question development processes in, uh, from the exam uh, and the recruitment process there was a research team that were doing and developing questions thousands and tens of thousands of those so we start building that so th we run national level exams for example for 15,000 uh, uh, positions mm -hmm. of entry level we had close to 600,000 applications across the country and then we had to go to every province and do the exams uh, and then out the outcome of that was changing a lot of perceptions uh, and then the middle ground the law was allowing ministries to do the grade the technical part which was grade four and three and that was also problematic because uh, the ministry, ministers and ministries were doing through the old way of nepotism and all of that. Uh, to prevent them also, we said, you, yes, the law allows you to do it, but you have to do it at the exam centers. So they had to do it at the, and slowly it started changing. We didn't get to the, to make it further institutionalized. For grade one and two, which is director and general directors, we made a lot of progress. And there was the capable individuals mm -hmm. who, believed in the constitution and in the flag and the, uh, the, the, the notion of public service. Mm -hmm. A lot of women that come into, we increased from 28% to 27% to 31% wow, uh, uh, the women. Then the next phase of it was to reform the structural form of the government. And so we did a lot of work there, removed overlaps, we introduced job descriptions, we introduced appraisals, not only individuals, because individuals would receive a sign from the director because he knew it uh, or she knew it. I, we say, your directorate will be assessed and appraised. And then if you fail and you have appraised everybody positively, then it's your failure. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. So that, that way we begin to push the, uh, 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 the process. However, a lot of political backlashes, parliament wants just walked out and said, we, I have to cancel the uh, uh, certain steps that I had. Mm -hmm. But I had to do a lot of outreach to have to go to them. Uh, MPs would line up in my door with their letters. I had to respect them, mm -hmm. uh, talk to them, explain to them the process. 
and go back and walk to them to the door and say goodbye. And most of the time, they would say, call back and say, did you say yes or no? I say, well, there's only one way. It's, it's the law. But it requires a lot of political will. You know, uh, a lot of Americans aren't aware of this, but there was a prolonged period in American history when the federal government worked exactly the same way. Abraham Lincoln uh, left many letters uh, complaining bitterly about the fact that he had to uh, listen to all of these appeals from constituents who wanted a job in the federal government. And at that point, the United States had no professional civil service, no you know, merit-based requirements for entering into the civil service, and that's a system that survived in the U.S. up until the 1880s. Uh, so Afghanistan, you know, in many ways is not so different. Uh, it's just that, uh, unfortunately, you had to try to do it very, very quickly under, you know, conditions of extreme violence. Do you have any idea, certainly the women were all uh, excluded, but do you have any idea whether any of the people that worked for you are still actually in place under the Taliban since the, they took over? Yeah, the uh, one part that gives me uh, some confidence that if good work is going through uh, and the institutions to an extent, if those work are uh, uh, institutionalized and to an extent are being uh, endorsed by the public, it's hard for politicians to easily remove uh, uh, those systems and places. When the Taliban came, they uh, 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 dismissed almost every processes for merit based. Mm -hmm. They uh, reduced the authority of the Civil Service Commission. So it was, it's not anymore an independent commission. It's a small office within the office of their so-called uh, Prime Minister. Uh, uh, but some of the staff that stayed there continued to resist. Mm -hmm. And then the public start criticizing and a lot of like outcries uh, at, uh, for, to the Taliban that you're bringing only mullahs and you're, there was this process of merit-based recruitment, it was working, it was a national budget was spent on it and all of these uh, computer, national computer-based uh, exam, uh, civil service exam centers across the country, why you're not using that. So what they did, and the, those pressure, they started going back only for the uh, grade three and four, which are technical, they allowed some process, th the same process that we had. But the director level and the entry level, they're doing it again through their own political, without merit-based and direct. So some of this stuff mm -hmm. do exist. Some of them are in the Ministry of Finance, some of them in public sec public health sector, there's a lot of them still uh, working, uh, uh, the, me uh, the medical, mm -hmm. but no, no woman uh, at sure. all. Uh, uh, so the size of shrink, the size of civil service sector, because they dismissed a lot of them, they brought in a lot of mullahs uh, 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 in state. So the uh, the professionalism that was slowly finding its way into the public sector uh, of uh, educated people and this fresh fresh uh, uh, blood that was injected into it uh, is is undermined. Unfortunately, yeah, no, it's really tragic. Uh, what was going on in the ANA, in the Afghan National Army? Did you see the same degree of nepotism and corruption there, or ethnic-based, you know, promotions, or was there a core of professionalism, you know, in that organization? We had part of the ANA uh, that were highly professional. Mm -hmm. uh, those were the special operation forces, the commandos, and most of them educated inside, but also a lot of them uh, outside in Sandhurst or West Point and other places. But they had also very, very good mentors and trainers from Norway, from Netherlands, uh, from mm -hmm. Germany and the United States. Combined, those were probably uh, uh, unique forces, even uh, because in most of the, these competitive uh, friendly trainings that they were going to Jordan and other places, they were coming on top, uh, one of the best uh, uh, of, of special operation forces and commandos. Uh, their bound was more of that camaraderie being within the army, being within the force, 
uh, rather than ethnic. They were coming from all over the country, mm -hmm. not only one ethnic group. The rest of the institution, unfortunately, the rest of the ANA and especially ANP, the Afghan National Police, were very badly uh, uh, made. We, uh, throughout the, the seven years of President Rani, also could not reform it. Uh, there was some attempts, some of which, especially in the last three years of his presidency, went very, very bad and wrong and became political because of the wrong uh, uh, coordinator role uh, uh, that was at the national security uh, uh, that, that was carrying it out, and a lot of nepotism uh, got through. But the foundation of it were put wrongly. It become uh, a quota system mm -hmm. to say on the surface it was good because it could satisfy every uh, 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 ethnic group in Afghanistan and, mm -hmm. and it become uh, a real national institution where every ethnic group is in it. But then the way it was done, especially on the senior officers, it was then th those who were calling themselves an ethnic leader, a politician that was part of a coalition of the government or outside, but influential, they were given the privilege for them to introduce names of, as an example, a name from Pashtun, a name from Tajik, a name from Hazara and, and Uzbek. Instead of going, keeping the principle of ethnic inclusion and diversity, but through professionalism. Mm -hmm. There were professional people in all of these ethnic groups. There was no need to go to X leader, Y leader to, to ask them to introduce somebody who does not have professional background mm -hmm. to be within the, uh, within the army. So that went wrong. There was, of course, as we found in the civil service, um, I, uh, we implemented the uh, human resource information management system. I had to send people throughout the country to get biometric data, biographic data of all civil servants. And the, the very sad story was that we uh, ended up finding out over 60,000 ghost uh, uh, employees that mm -hmm. we had to cut from mm -hmm. uh, uh, the payment that they were receiving the payment. The good story was that the system was designed in-house, implemented in a short time by world-class, I would say, director, female director that implemented it. In the army also, and especially in the police, the ghost was a major problem, the, the ghost uh, soldiers and the ghost uh, police officers. That, that also undermined the, uh, uh, the, the ability of the army to be much more professional. Mm -hmm. um, and then in terms of the overall policy, uh, it was shifting from time to time. Um, during President Karzai, there was not much of encouragement to the army and its professionalism. The president was not owning the army while well, the commander-in-chief is not owning the army mm -hmm. then there's not much of feeling attached to or defending uh, 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 throughout the ranks while under president Rani he owned the army mm -hmm. and he was really acting claiming to be the commander-in-chief and he was so enthusiastic about it but then the way especially in the last three years he have carried out undermined a lot of the mm -hmm. uh, uh, army abilities because he assigned the tasks to people with no experience of uh, uh, military uh, and, and that also undermined his own goal mm -hmm. uh, and he defeated himself by uh, uh, choosing a wrong route. Yeah. Well, uh, it's, a, it's a very tragic story, uh, you know, this whole effort to transform Afghan society uh, from the ground up. Uh, uh, do you see any rays of hope at the moment? Uh, uh, Francis, it is, it is uh, painful and, and, and very, very sad, and especially with a lot of people, uh, including those in the United States, uh, have, have contributed both blood and treasure. A lot of sacrifices were, were made, ultimate sacrifices. 60,000 Afghan soldiers have lost their life defending this new Afghanistan, the constitution of it on its flag, and there are over 2,000 U.S. personnel who have given ultimate sacrifices. And the outcome, unfortunately, is catastrophe. And, and then the hope is so limited or none when we look uh, today what the Taliban are carrying out and what they do, they have turned Afghanistan to a prison. Uh, they are systematically, while gender apartheid is not defined in, in any international human rights documents, but every single element of a crime of apartheid is now carried out against women in Afghanistan. And there is no hope that the Taliban would change its attitude toward it. Uh, it is an 
purely theological authoritarian regime uh, that continues to suppress its own population while does not uh, at all care about uh, what consequences uh, uh, are, are are having their policies toward the, mm -hmm. the general public. Now that's uh, uh, not a good story uh, of, of hope, but my hope is still with those uh, uh, young Afghans who, especially women, continue to be on the streets uh, demanding their rights despite all the odds and being suppressed and, and arrested. There are a lot of other activists that I know across the country. They are quietly trying to save, save the civic space and mobilize culturally and to create some sort of social capital by debating among themselves uh, and trying to find ways to push bottom up. Some of them end up in jails, as an example, very famous uh, uh, civil society leader who was campaigning for education for the past one decade is now sitting for over two months uh, in in prison just because he's campaigning for education. It's not an easy path. Uh, so waiting for Taliban naturally to uh, uh, to go away uh, is is it's is not happen. is not going to happen and is not going to be the solution. Uh, no. So there must be continued international engagement, but much more. Uh, uh, the Afghans themselves need to yeah. uh, uh, find ways to to get rid of them. And unfortunately, I'm afraid that much of the outside world has uh, lost interest in Afghanistan, uh, including the United States, which uh, pretty much washed its hands of this country that it, it had really tried to transform. Well, Nader, uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, I wish you the best personally. I'm glad you survived this experience. It was a you know, very noble effort to try to actually modernize uh, the state in Afghanistan. And I think it's one that could have succeeded at some level if the United States had uh, been able to tough it out a little bit um, uh, longer than, uh, than it did. But you know, we are where we are. So thank you very much. Uh, I take it you're uh, in the process of writing up your experiences uh, at the Woodrow Wilson Center. So I wish you, I look forward to the results of what you do, uh, write and your reflections on that entire uh, historical episode. So thank you very much for talking to me. Well, thank you very much, Francis, for the opportunity. It's, it's fascinating to, to always listen to you, but also uh, a, a privilege to be engaged in a discussion with you. Yeah, I mean, I must say that um, it was really Afghanistan that first led me to this whole problem of state building, because, you know, when I wrote The End of History and the Last Man in uh, the early 1990s, you know, like many people in the West, you take the existence of a state and especially a modern, uncorrupt state for granted. And uh, you don't realize how difficult it is to actually bring one about. And I think it was really with Afghanistan and then with Iraq where you had the state collapse and the responsibility for state functions being thrown on a bunch of foreigners that didn't really understand the culture and you know the traditions of these societies that it was became clear to me at least, that this was a big problem in American foreign policy, but in American society in general, because Americans don't like the state, they don't trust it, they think the main objective of a political system is to constrain the state, but if you don't have a state in the first place to constrain, you're going to be in an even worse situation. Absolutely, and Afghanistan could give a lot of very clear empirical lesson learned examples uh, uh, for, for a lot of these scenarios uh, in absence of a functioning state, in absence of, uh, of, of a civil service sector that could deliver services to people, and especially in those very significantly fragile societies, you can't have the possibility of an economy grow. You can't have a possibility of people planning for long term mm -hmm. because all of this is are dependent on the political stability and the state's survival. And if those do not exist, people are thinking of short-term solutions. And corruption breeds from it uh, primarily. And people who look for short-term opportunities is undermining the economy, undermining the private sector, undermining the, the public sector are, are all equally. So the, the core of uh, sustainability of a state and, uh, and the public's 
confidence in it that it will stay and their long-term planning uh, goes uh, hand in hand uh, 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 which mostly the World Bank forgets, the UN forgets, uh, the, the aid agencies forget about it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Good. Okay. Well, thank you very much and thank you. best of luck to you. Thank you. Thank you very much.